it is 3.20 Nigeria time. It is time to start the webinar discussion on the subject COVID-19, stimulating the economy and employment in the wake of the global pandemic. This webinar discussion is powered by system the leading skill and training development organization in Nigeria. My name is Festus Adebayo. I produce housing development program on AIT and TBC Television Continental in Nigeria. Permit me at this time to invite the moderator for this program, the moderator for this program, who is also the Director General of System, Buda Anthony Okwa, to take over from me while we we'll back soon. Buda Okwa, it's your time. Let me rest for a few minutes. I'll take over from here and handle the program, please. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very please. much, first of all. I'll ask you to be on standby as the host. I am in the beautiful but locked down city of uh, Joss. Yes, up on the plateau. The weather is quite beautiful here. I hope it's like that for all the other participants from I'm different parts of the world. I can see some of my friends from India, the UK, Canada, the US. I believe a few more are, are joining us. Some try to connect. That will be uh, it's a pleasure to have you here. It seems like we are already in May. And therefore, from when COVID-19 emerged in December 2019, it's just five months. But I'm sure that the disruptive effect is such that for many of us, it feels like we've been locked down for the past five years. That is the disruptive situation that we have had to experience given the COVID-19 situation, which has rapidly halted the global economies, except for uh, China from which it started, when the news of um, COVID-19 started trickling in from Wuhan in December, some of us actually felt it was something very remote and we will soon peter out. But then when we started hearing about the challenges and the lockdown there, the mere fact that China had become such a big predator, actually elicited different feelings in different people. But little did we know that we are going to come to this pass. The transformation has been rapid and the growth of the virus has been exponential. The impact on the economy is such that several sectors have been shut down. And uh, for us, a system, an organization that is de dedicated towards uh, addressing the issue of unemployment by providing skills to young persons in order to enable them fit into various economic activities, particularly in the construction sector. Just when we were beginning to think we were, we had started scratching the surface, we found ourselves having to slide down rapidly. The transformation has been tremendous from uh, what we would say is a 30% unemployment rate, we now have a situation that is hovering around 70%. And that, therefore, we felt it necessary for us to come together and discuss with our partners and stakeholders, as well as other interested persons to share experiences and to look at the way forward. It's my pleasure, therefore, to welcome the chairman of the board of system, Reverend Ugochuku Chime who himself is a major employer of labor. The Copen group that he heads currently employs and provides the means of sustenance for about 30,000 people. And his business interests span across the globe from West Africa, Ghana, the UK, the US, and so on. To uh, say a few words as opening remarks before we usher in panelists. We'll keep it short and sharp. Uh, COVID-19 does not allow us to dilly-dally too much. 
Well, thank you very much. You're welcome, sir. Thank you so much, the moderator and the director general of system. And I'd like to welcome Barry and welcome uh, all the rest of the people, Ibrahim, also Mohammed and then Victoria, and then of course, Festus. The issue we have come to share about on the issue of uh, the linkage and the need for us to use the artisanal training as a means of onboarding people into employment is very critical and onboarding them into some level of entrepreneurship. Over the years, we've had this notion that white collar jobs is the way to go about rekindling the economic potentials of any nation. But as time has gone on, we have come to realize that most countries that have gone to full blown capacity of their social economic capability went through the route of SME, small and medium scale enterprises. And we have come to appreciate the fact that most of the SMEs grew up from artisans who, are, who developed skills in various areas. And from those skills they developed, from being a one man enterprise, they were able to have apprentices, they were able to have colleagues that they can now begin to grow and have a defined growth path to being full grown employers themselves, instead of being only the employee of the organization. So uh, for us in system, it's an opportunity to bring once more to the forefront the need for us to look at the construction industry, which has the quickest impact in terms of value for employment or value for impact on the socioeconomic sphere of any country when you appraise it. And that is why I'd like to welcome my colleagues and welcome the participants who are uh, on and those who may listen later to ask us to look critically at this sector because it holds the key. System has been at the forefront of developing this uh, idea of mobile training and making sure that you train people where they are and domesticating some of the best international practices um, to ensure that we're able to move forward. On behalf of the board of system and all the other stakeholders, I'd like to welcome all of you to this beautiful outing and ask that we contribute, whether by way of questions on the chat group so that we're able to have an interactive and a full brainstorming with a way to developing some definable milestones and strategies for using the sector and using artisans and using artisanal training to ensure that we reduce the unemployment and to ensure that we have a pathway for our people to be involved in meaningful activity post-COVID. Thank you and God bless you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Chairman. Uh, it's my pleasure now to welcome the panelists, especially, and introduce them to the uh, attendees. We have six very distinguished speakers, each of whom will speak for five minutes. Uh, we have the Director General of the Abuja Chamber of Commerce and Industry, Victoria Akai, you're welcome. We also have Engineer ADK Mohammed, Director of the National Board for Technical Education, uh, Barry, Engineer Barry Nelson, he usually doesn't want a title, <laughs> the Chief Executive Officer of the Construction Industry Training Board of Northern Ireland. Uh, you're welcome, Barry. Uh, Ibrahim Dibia has just retired from the Federal Ministry of Labor and Employment, where he was Director of the Vocational Skills Department. He is now consulting in the area of skills development. We also have the vice chairman of the Council of Registered Builders of Nigeria, who is also the chairman of the technical committee of the Nigerian Skills Expo and Artisans Awards, Dr. Samson Okpalua. You're all welcome. Uh, you. Without much ado, I'll call on uh, the DD, Abuja Chamber of Commerce and Industry. Definitely this uh, COVID-19 has brought Abuja to a standstill. And the impact is something that you will definitely be addressing as DG. 
as the Abuja Chamber of Commerce has interests across all the economic sectors. You are welcome, uh, Gigi. Thank you uh, so much, uh, Builder Okwa. Um, thank you uh, to the Chairman of the Board of System for organizing this very timely um, webinar. Um, I would like to also welcome my co-panelists and participants. I'm going to be speaking about, oh, sorry, let me get my slides out, okay. I'm going to be speaking about the impact of COVID-19 on the global and domestic economy, challenges and opportunities. Now, we all know that the outbreak of the COVID-19 is a black swan event. It has disrupted the entire systems of the world, political, social, economic, religious systems, financial structures, even the family structure, the whole world is affected. The world's topmost economies, such as the US, China, UK, Germany, uh, France, Italy, are on the verge of collapse. That's what we're hearing, that economic activities have stopped, airlines are no longer flying, um, the hospitality industry is uh, adversely affected, manufacturing. In fact, um, it is said that the world is experiencing the most difficult economic situation since the World War II. The human cost is immeasurable. We cannot even begin to say out, roll out figures. We can only uh, estimate. Besides, of course, the stock, stock market has fallen. Um, we do not have enough time to talk about the fall of the oil prices. There was a, a, a time in the US when uh, the oil prices fell down to a minus uh, dollar figure. The Nobel virus has kept us all contained in our houses, maybe for months, and is already changing the way we relate with each other, with government and with the outside world. Um, experts are speculating that it might even be worse, and we might still have more um, unsettling situations in the future. So the question is, are nations going to stay closed? Um, will touch become a taboo? And what becomes of business? Now let's look at this, the figures. As of today, we have um, so far 3.8 million cases, more than 3.8 million cases, um, over 260,000 deaths. Um, but the good news is um, there are about 1.2 million persons who have recovered from the virus. In Nigeria, we now have over 3,000 confirmed cases, over 100 deaths, and um, over 500 discharged cases. Now, what was the Nigeria's economy before COVID? It was fragile. GDP growth was estimated at 2%. Um, Poverty rates was very high. Unemployment is very high. Um, over 70% of Nigerians were living below the absolute poverty line. That has increased now. So we have more than 70% Nigeria, of Nigerians living um, below $1.9 a day. And of course, there was a steep decline in foreign exchange. Um, according to the MD of IMF, uh, Nigeria is being threatened by twin shocks. The first is the COVID-19 pandemic itself, and then there's the international fall of uh, oil prices. The measures that 
uh, governments globally have adopted to the spread of the virus is partial or total country lockdown. Um, almost all physical activities stopped, closure of commercial services, industries, international airports, public and private schools, universities, stores everywhere, except of course for a few essential services. Now the consequences of this of the pandemic and its measures have caused countries to um, change the way we do things forever. It has completely changed the way we live, work and do business. And I also think that therein lies also lies opportunities. Um, on the extent of global and domestic disruptions, there are disruptions on supply chains. Um, the global supply chains due to China's factory closures, quarantine workers, shortages of inputs and has, has resulted in shortages of inputs and, uh, and components. We know that there is hardly any um, industry in Nigeria and in fact, in most parts of the world, that does not take something along its supply chain in, from China. So this has really extended regional declines in, it, uh, COVID has also extended regional declines in international tourism and business travel. Uh, demand has been disrupted. For example, the global demand for oil has dropped. The global demand for tourism and the hospitality industry has dropped. Um, financial markets have been disrupted. What is the impact on employment? All areas of work have been affected. And according to ILO, um, some 144 million workers in the food accommodation, we're talking about restaurants and hotels, about 144 million workers are, adver are adversely affected. In, re in retail and wholesale, 482 million. And business services, 157 million. In manufacturing, 463 million jobs are affected. Um, together, they add up to about 37.5% of the global employment rate. This is a disaster. So about, if you add this up, about 1.2 billion persons are being affected by the effect of, by the impact of the pandemic. The quantity of jobs have been affected, yes, both unemployment and underemployment. Um, about 81% of the global workforce um, have had their workplaces fully or partly closed. There has been restrictions on daily life. Nearly 200 million people could end up out of work. The outbreak is expected to wipe out up to 6.7% of working hours worldwide. Um, and that is an equivalent of 195 million full-time workers losing their jobs. The quality of work has also been, been affected. And it depends on the kind of work you're doing. If, for instance, your work is more of um, uh, administrative, uh, computerized, you do most of your work online, then you might not be affected as much as someone who has to be on ground. For instance, mm -hmm. facility managers, factory workers. The quality of work has significantly dropped in a lot of uh, sectors. Now, um, How quickly the world recovers from this will depend on, how quickly the world uh, recovers from unemployment will depend on how quickly the world recovers in the second half of this year um, and how effectively we apply policy measures to boost the demand for labor. There's a high risk that at the end of the year, worldwide unemployment figure will be much higher than these projections that, that we have, uh, uh, that I have uh, called out. Um, so in Nigeria, we expect 
that or generally we expect that COVID-19 is going to fade out as with other pandemics. But how fast is the social, the socioeconomic impact going to fade out? It's going to stay really long with us. It's going to permanently change the way we do things. The corona outbreak, outbreak is speeding up an evolution of work, of the way we do work and the way we do business. Ultimately, we will have to read two multiple industries. Um, we will have to do, we have to change everything from conferences to collaborations on sales, and uh, commercial real estate has to be rethought. Um, I mean, the corona scare might actually help us to think of better ways of doing work. Now, generally and particularly in Nigeria, we also have to look at economic diversification. This corona has opened our eyes to a lot of things and has confirmed some of our fears that our dependence on oil um, is going to, is, 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 is very adverse to our economy. When the coronavirus started, we were looking for little things as hand sanitizers, face masks, uh, yeah. and up to ventilators. We couldn't source them within this country. There was a lot of, okay, let us see what we're going to do with the manufacturers. Let's talk to them. Can they improvise something? People were turning their tailoring shops to face mask um, factories. So we really need to look inwards and diversify the economy. We need to look at agriculture, manufacturing, solid minerals, construction. Mm -hmm. We really need to diversify we, to cater for our own domestic um, economy. We need to improve on the ease of doing business in Nigeria, uh, to be honest. We have to go back to the drawing board and look at it again. We need to use this opportunity to take things online now, to reduce the human-to-human -human interactions, and then to become more efficient. We need to also look at attracting investors. These are all opportunities that can come out from this pandemic. Attract more investors who can come in with large-scale industries and employ large numbers. We need to improve skilled labor work delivery and uh, work towards creating an alternative location for production for China. I believe we can do it. Now, um, still in looking for opportunities, we need to look at the income generating employment opportunities for our young adults. Um, Looking at the new realities that have started, we also need to adjust our curriculums. We need to match, also match our job skills with um, our job needs, with our job skills <laughs> development. Systematically, we need to involve the private sector in building a needs-based skills training curriculum, um, provide financing facilities and access to business development services and markets for SMEs, and then significantly improve on our internet infrastructure. Uh, Builder Okwa, I know I have five minutes, so you have to stop me. I really have a lot to say. There are also a lot of um, opportunities for the individual um, businessmen. If you are into manufacturing, you, you now have to look at smart manufacturing. What is the broad category of uh, manufacturing that employs, which is a broad category of manufacturing that employs, of course, computer integrated manufacturing. We need to leverage on e-commerce and digital payments. We also need to innovate really that health and business profitability are directly related. If, you're, if we're not healthy, there is no business. COVID-19 has clearly, um, uh, defined those lines for us. We need to look at doing things, migrating our services online, trainings. Um, I saw uh, last week that court sessions are even being held in Lagos online through Zoom. Um, our schools, we need, to, we need to see how we can mi migrate our educational system online. And then yeah. one other opportunity that has come out is environmental protection. So now we're not okay. flying up and down, okay? Is my time off? Yeah, I think, 
Yes, well, you were speaking so well, and the statistics were really interesting, although shocking. Uh, you touch on quite a few areas that are of concern. And of course, what you are throwing up as opportunities are actually areas of concern for some of us, because when we talk about smart manufacturing or smart production and social distance, distancing, it only translates to uh, technology taking over some of the jobs that we will be striving to create. I wonder how we're going to address that paradox. Let me quickly invite the next speaker, Engineer ADK Mohammed. Please, five minutes, because we set one hour for this program. We started late, and um, even if we stretch on to two, three, uh, 4.30, it would already be exceeding the time we set for the program. Time is, is important. Thank you. Ibrahim Jibia. Yes, I'm hearing you. Yes, impact of COVID on recent in initiatives to boost employment. You've been at the helm of affairs and a lot of initiatives have emerged from the ministry and its various agencies. Yes. And of course, you're also in touch with what is happening in other sectors. So can you just give us your own insight? Thank you. Yes, thank you very much, Mr. Okwa. Yeah, there are, have been, there have been many initiative by the government, you know. The most prominent one was the Empower, which dwelt on the construction industry, where people were selected to be trained in specific construction trades, and also in the mechatronics, the automobile trade. This went a long way in impacting relevant skills to our youth. We also have the government uh, policy on local content initiative by Federal Executive Council, where it was uh, instructed that all contracts are awarded to either local or foreign companies must have a local labor content, whereby they have to show the number of jobs they are going to create when they are executing those contracts. These have also gone a long way to give our youths the desired uh, employment. Of course, the government also established and uh, renovated a lot of vocational training centers and laid a lot of emphasis on emerging vocational trades, where youths were taught on uh, POP, tiling, satellite, and uh, CCTV. We also dwelt on uh, automobile mechatronics. All these vocational training centers turned out a lot of graduates who are ready to take up jobs. And uh, with this current pandemic, most of these jobs are at a standstill. So there are a lot of challenges there. We also have the ITF's NSIDP, that is National Industrial Skills Development Program, where youths are also trained on various vocational trades and even given startup packs so that they can establish their own businesses and also employ others. All these were ongoing before the pandemic. We also have the government say 1,000 jobs in each local government by the special host program of the NDE. It was about to kickstart when the pandemic sets in. Well, we also have the federal government's 10 million jobs to Nigerians, and it was targeted at agriculture, mining, and ICT. I was happy when Madame was saying that people should diversify and move away from reliance on, the, on oil as our source of revenue. If we channel our use to agriculture, to the mining, and also to ICT, and I have to emphasize that in ICT as the woman that just talked said, it's something that you can do within, even within the comfort of your room or your office. We are encouraging our youth to key into the ICT development. It's an area that a lot of youth will be employed. And uh, the effect of the pandemic on all these uh, jobs that were initiated by the government are very clear. As my colleague said, you cannot go to work when there is a lockdown. So a lot of work jobs have been uh, at standstill. 
So we encourage that our youth should embark on these ICT jobs that you can work at home. I am happy most of the manufacturing industries that has computer-based operations are telling their workers to work at home. The banks are diversifying in the areas of you don't need to go to the bank. Unfortunately, we see after the relaxing of the lockdown, banks offices where banks halls were jam packed. But we have seen some banks coming up with a lot of innovations that you can transact your business in the comfort of your room using either your computer or your smartphone. All these are very important innovations that are coming as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. So yeah, thank I you very much. We we'll have to wrap up there. Uh, oh, the thank question you. Thank is, you. how many of these jobs can be done from home? That is the big elephant in the Zoom, as some people say. Uh, apparently, we skipped uh, Barry when we called on Engineer ABK. Engineer ABK is back now, but uh, let's hear it for Barry. Barry is the Chief Executive Officer of CITV Northern Ireland, like I said, but uh, by virtue of uh, Northern Ireland being a major skills hub for the UK, his activities actually transcend the construction industry. So let's have your views, uh, Barry. You're welcome. Thank you very much and, and hello to everyone. Could I maybe just reprise um, a couple of the comments that uh, Victoria Aki um, identified that I think are very true and to bear in mind as we move forward? is the changes we're seeing just now, I think will be embedded and have an impact forever. And I think that's a very important thing to, to bear in mind. But also she said something which I, I believe is extremely important, is that from this situation, there are also opportunities that can arise from this. Um, but I may come back to that later in the discussion. But what I was here to talk about today is the, the idea of how prepared is the training sector uh, for the new world um, in terms of keeping going emerging skills and training requirements for the industry. And as I, I thought about how to, to use my five minutes, I broke it down into two areas. And the two areas when we talk about training are actually are becoming quite obvious, and that is online training is one area and offline training or as I like to think of it physical training where there is a degree of physical interaction and each of those have different issues um, and different benefits. Um, firstly let me talk about briefly on online training. Now the principles of online training aren't new, they're, they're quite well, well established but the thing about online training is that it is knowledge based. It's about the transfer of information over, over electronic means. Um, and the issues that we encounter in online training is that while you might be able to transmit knowledge adequately, how can the candidate, the students, exhibit understanding of that knowledge? How can they evidence understanding of that knowledge? And how can they evidence their understanding of the practical applications of that knowledge and then how interactive is the online learning is there the ability to ask questions to interrogate and have the conversation is so important in how we learn things as as humans we have been working citb in northern Ireland. we're working on um, digital construction methods and we've been looking at uh, what we're calling a beyond blended approach and this means that when you're transferring information, there are different aspects of information in how you do it. There is the simple transfer of, of, of text, but that relies, if I may say, on a degree of education. It, it, it relies on people understanding how the, the, the text that is sent and different language of the, of the information become, becomes an issue. But if you blend that with webinars, such as we are doing today, then it allows students to actually absorb information and then gives the opportunity for them to discuss that information online, ask questions, interrogate, and test that understanding. And for the lecturers, it allows them to see that their students 
are starting to absorb and think about that information. A step further than that is then when we record these webinars and then that adds as an aid memoir to students. Rather than taking notes, they can go back to their online webinar and keep that up to date. So that's how we're looking at working online. But then leads you into another issue that we may have and that is to do with delivery styles and learning styles. Knowledge by text doesn't suit every individual and indeed in some areas uh, people may be limited by their ability to pick up information from the written word. But also when we are learning as people and certainly within the industry that I'm in, in construction, it needs to be contextualised. People learn better if we present that information in scenarios that are familiar to their day-to-day -day work. And I think that's very important when we get into online, line, online learning, that we try and replicate that as much as possible. And what we have been doing here at CITB is looking at project-based work. So there is a bit of learning, there's a principle to be learned, and then there is a task. And it's a fairly well embedded um, educational technique. We're just moving it to, to an online basis. But all of this is old technology. There is nothing new in what we're trying to do. The question for us moving forward is that are people ready to learn in this way? And possibly just as important is are our lecturers, as our, our, our teachers, are they ready to teach in this way? And I think the answer to that question is yes and no in equal terms. Some are, some aren't. And it will also um, depend on the, 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 the subject of what we're learning. And I think they're going to have to think very differently about how we do that. I'm going to very quickly leave it there and move on to what I think is the physical training and the issues around physical training as we go. Mm. Uh, I think this is particularly relevant. Okay, just one, one minute, uh, Barry, one minute. So okay. we can move on. It's, it's particularly relevant when we're talking about artisan training. Artisan need hand skills. You cannot teach hand skills online. And Victoria Aki was very, very much talking about the manufacturing. One of the things that we're finding in this current crisis is that areas who make things that are of value to others are the areas that are being sought after. Irrespective of uh, social distancing, it's products that we're looking for at the moment, not necessarily IT. So I think um, we, we, we forget about the artisan learning at our peril. Um, but this gives us an issue, issues around social distancing, accessibility, but the process of showing someone to do something, the coaching and mentoring of hand skills is, is very important and will be important going forward. But we have to revisit how we arrange our classrooms, how we arrange our learning facilities, and we have to look at how we deal with social distancing while actually teaching. And I think there are lots of practical things here that we know that are there and we can deal with. We, we haven't thought about it before. So I think what will definitely happen is the cost of learning will increase because in a class size you'll have less people because of social distancing. You, Lecturers will have to sanitise between different individuals as they coach and mentor. Um, and all of that pushes the, the, the cost up and up and up as we go. But I'm going to come back, I'm going to finish on this, and this is my last comment, and, and to pick up on Victoria's point about there being an opportunity. The current virus, I think, is making people think differently about the mobility of a workforce. Within Nigeria, you have an enormous resource in your people. Uh, you have a potential workforce there. Often, as I have visited Nigeria, I have seen where there are, in many areas, foreign workers. Um, I think you might find that foreign workers from other countries are less, um, less keen to move and travel into different countries. So it does give you the opportunity to make that resource, uh, to use that resource that you already have of your own population. And I think bringing them into education in a managed way could be the opportunity that Nigeria has for the future. That's as much as I'll say at the moment. Thank you very much. Uh, I was actually hoping that technology would um, reduce the cost of delivering training, but definitely, their hands on learning is required. Uh, blended learning would introduce new costs. 
it's my opportunity now to welcome engineer ADK Mohammed. We've heard it from uh, Barry, uh, the regulator, the National Board for Technical Education. We have to start keeping things differently. You've been very reluctant to look at the use of technology, even though um, there has been quite a bit of talk about blend learning. But the, on, on the assessment part in particular, we are very much concerned, particularly with respect to the Empower beneficiaries who are out there on the field now. The uh, apprenticeship has been truncated somewhat, uh, but we have to assess them, and we have to assess them using social distancing methods, and that might uh, compel the use of technology. Let's hear it from MBT engineer ADK. Good afternoon, uh, fellow participants. Uh, I would like to thank uh, System for this a short opportunity to discuss these issues that are pertinent and of global implications. But what I'm going to say is more likely to be the effect of COVID, I mean, on, on the generality of our uh, economy uh, than Tibet alone, uh, education and training. I will say something about that too and how we expect to respond to the challenges posed by the COVID-19. But well, my, my comments are generally going to be on the economy, employment, and generally uh, in Africa, and particularly probably in Nigeria, uh, what are the issues that we have. We must know that uh, we, as we have all said, that COVID has come with a completely new set of uh, conditions in which we will have to continue to play with uh, for the past, for the next uh, one or two years. Uh, nothing will be normal as it is, uh, going back to post-COVID is not an option. It is, it's not being debated. What is normal is that the future normal will be uh, a place whereby we have some stability in our economy, in our interactions and our trips and a lot of other things and the way that we do business. So and that will change from post-COVID and will never go back to uh, before COVID. Uh, I would like us to look at uh, some of the uh, statistics that we have for Nigeria and for Africa in, uh, in general. Uh, if you look at certain observations I have uh, looked at with COVID, uh, I would like to say that there are certain things that COVID specifically uh, has uh, and applies differently in different parts of the world. Uh, one of them is, is the effect of temperature and, and environment. Uh, it is clear that uh, COVID, COVID's uh, ability to, to transmit and COVID's disease uh, is, is very, very much uh, lower in high temperature environments. But that is not the only thing that is there. If you look at, uh, I've come to this conclusion, of course, uh, from the statistics that are on the ground. Uh, if you look at, for example, India that has over a billion population, Nigeria with about 200 million uh, population, we have just about 100 mortality. But if you look at even in Africa, the, the, the countries that have this highest mortality are the ones at the periphery, South Africa in the south and up in Morocco and, and uh, Tunisia and Algeria being higher. The only country that is very hot and has a high rate is Egypt. And Egypt, uh, uh, we will we'll put them together with Saudi Arabia being hot, but they have a little bit higher and it's mainly because of tourism. So temperature is making a lot of effect. Now the second issue is the, is the age. Uh, this there is a recent study by Yale. The the age we have in Africa is generally tending to to, to the youth, and COVID is uh, disproportionately taking more of older uh, uh, situations. Uh, number three. We also have to take a look at how COVID uh, uh, interacts with the health system. Uh, I will come to explain to you why I'm bringing these statistics. I'm trying to bring it in the sense that our response, especially in Nigeria, for example, and other third world countries that are in the whole region, our response should, responses to COVID should be different from the responses that we see typically in Europe and, and North America. Uh, uh, the other, the other issue is, is, a, is the health facility. 
the health facility by locking down in Nigeria and such other countries, we are not gaining much because our health facilities are already overwhelmed, even post-COVID, almost overwhelmed post-COVID. So locking down too long will not assist. Anytime we come out of it, we are going to go back to square one. But in Europe, if they lock, it, if they lock down, they will reduce the number and the health facility rates are very high so that the flattening can be within the health facility. This flattening does not hold to be the same in our countries. It will never flatten below the health facility line. It will most likely flatten above the health facility line. So we should look at uh, scenarios in which we gradually reduce this lockdown and much faster than Europe and America because our economies are different. Another impact is the economy itself. In Africa, 60-70% of the economy is informal, and which means direct uh, distance. So the economy will suffer more in Africa than in those uh, countries. So these are things that we need to look at. Now, what, what do we hope to uh, have in the country uh, as a society? We agree social distancing, face marks, and all these things sanitary must come in. But responses to countries in Africa, such as Nigeria, must be country specific. In Nigeria, for example, our economy is unfortunately heavily dependent on, on, on oil. And uh, definitely we have to recheck, we have to look at the, the, the statistics, I mean the budget uh, lines. And I will give you some, some of the things that uh, the country, the Nigerian government is doing. Right now, we are trying to borrow up to about 6.9 billion from international lenders. And we are lucky that IMF has uh, released about 3.4 billion US uh, dollars to stimulate our economy. That one is not alone by the African Union Development Agency. Now, what this agency did was that they found economic experts and to say, okay, within, within uh, the African economy, each sector, for example, construction, uh, 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 retail and business, how long will that sector take to recover from the effect of COVID? And out of the two extreme uh, models they have taken, we have seen that the, the recovery of COVID uh, in almost all the sectors cannot be before 18 months. Hardly. And uh, luckily, construction sector is one of the ones that will cover very, very fast in all models. And uh, the construction sector will recover in about two years. So uh, uh, the, most of them will take between that 18 months and five years. Uh, if I have my listing, I could have uh, shown you some of the uh, 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 sectors. So when, what, what, what we need to do as businesses and uh, government and private uh, sectors, when a small and medium term businesses, I think we should have to think of the way of how we do business. Can we look at those opportunities that are given by COVID? Pardon? 60 seconds. 60 seconds. Okay. <laughs> One minute. So, so we have to look at areas that are, 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 are decent, and that is uh, IT, the health sector, and education and training. And even within education and training, we have to do business differently, which means all cognitive training, all cognitive training must be online. It is only when we come to skills competency-based uh, training, uh, after applying the online uh, technological uh, aspects like what we have in the KM, we can now come uh, to, to practicals within a short period, a short window and a short period in such a way that the, the contact is greatly reduced within the training. Now, all our curricula uh, must be revised to incorporate COVID-related training and COVID-related measures. Uh, not to talk of also if there are any technologies that are brought up by COVID, which we have to uh, respond to. These are some of the few things I would like to say. Uh, I have a lot of things, but the time cannot. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, yeah. Well, the magnitude of the challenge is such that um, we we all have something to say because um, 
the situation of unemployment has impacted directly on the security, the national security. So definitely we must concern ourselves with that. We have a poll already on the screen. For those of you who are in the audience, please take some time off to answer the questions appearing on your screen. For the panelists, I also appeal to you to look at the Q&A sec sec section because we have to manage time as much as possible. We've already lost a bit of time so that you can respond to some of the questions directed to you. Um, I would want to fly a kite, taking a cue from what uh, engineer ADK just said about the age factor in relation to COVID. Perhaps we should be looking at re lowering the re retirement age, noting that even the restrictive lockdown that we have now, those above a certain age are told to remain indoors. I wonder how that will go with the rest of us. Uh, meanwhile, I think uh, it's time for us to hear engineer builder, Dr. Santi of Aloha, whose work calls across many sectors as well. You're welcome, doctor. Thank you so much, moderator. Uh, thank you, distinguished uh, panelists and distinguished participants. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, I want to take my few minutes to talk on the uh, strategies for rapid with COVID recovery for the construction. And I want to commend the organizers for already thinking ahead of uh, COVID. That's optimistic that we'll get out of it. And I, I subscribe to that idea. And uh, I want to also say that before we can talk of uh, recovery in the construction sector, uh, we need to review what happened to the construction sector as a result of this pandemic. And a lot of a number of the participants have mentioned in passing some of them. So I will review a few that impact directly on construction activities because construction industry is uh, an enabler and it's an activity that generates economy quickly. Uh, what has happened nationally to the national economy is that there's been a shutdown of intercontinental trade. Uh, that means that we cannot move from one country or one continent to another. There's been a shutdown of national economy. People are kept indoors. There's a downturn in national economy, even the strong economy and the value. Then, of course, coming home to uh, operations and track and manufacturing, we have industrial losses due to production downtime. We have loss of market and market share. Then we have losses due to inter interruption of direct process plants. There are some plants that are shut down now that we need a lot of arrangement, a lot of startup procedure and protocols in order to get this plant operating again. Then, of course, there is loss of people due to this unanticipated shutdown. Uh, in the contracts, we have uh, issues like post my job because this is an, an unanticipated incident that, that has happened with an unforeseen circumstance. Therefore, this will trigger a shutdown. Uh, and also, there will be project implications for construction contracts that are ongoing. Of course, that also dovetails into insurances for the worker, insurances for the project, insurances even for production uh, of the, in the emerging plant. Then we are going to definitely to have new operating norms and new operating systems. And this might necessitate a passion of some production actors in the economy. Of course, we have begun to imbibe a new health and safety coming down to construction as a sector that has been asked to kick on once so that because of this pandemic, there have been the use of the contract agreement. The contract agreements have been believing that we are going to have projects delivered in the right quality, the right quantity, the right time, the right, the right price. 
But this pandemic has created shutdown, which has not been foreseen by some of these contracts. And the necessary process in the agreement has to be activated. Uh, there could be frustration, there could be delay clauses, and there, there definitely has to be a tension for the period that work is not going on. Then, of course, we also have the issue of monetary claims because some of these uh, projects are meant to be revenue yielding, and the extension of time will trigger claims by the investor. These are some of the issues that come with construction with COVID. Uh, we also have issues of contract administration. Going forward, the methods of our contract administration will have to take into cognizance of this type of epidemic or pandemic, as we call it. Now, what that means is that the methods of our meeting, site project meetings, will have to be varied. Supervision and communication format to project management will change. Then, when it comes to construction management, we said the core activity. The methodology of construction will have to change because now we are limiting the number of people that can visit site, that can come to site, that can work on the site. Those are areas that will affect the methodology of construction. Then, of course, we have the supply chain management. Because of this short term, the number of the, 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 the inputs that are required for construction will not come at the time they have been scheduled. There will be supply chain hiccups. And these hiccups are going to affect subsequently how we run construction and project sites. Then, of course, we have the challenge of equipment scheduling and or operations. Many of the large construction companies do not actually own their own equipment. Now, with this shutdown, with this pandemic, there is going to be some reorganization because equipment are supposed to have been ordered and they are supposed to have their schedules for which they go to period site. Now this pandemic has disrupted them. Finally, on construction method and management, health and safety. If the new norm will now be that both the workers and those who come into the workforce have to be protected from contamination. And that means PPEs must be a necessity. That means also access to site and access to places must be protected. people must be protected and disinfected in order for them to operate properly then of course we have the challenge of facilities management and maintenance maintenance schedules have been disrupted and maintenance accesses have also been disrupted because now how to access and carry out maintenance operations will definitely be received because of the new norms that we are getting and finally, for construction uh, projects, we have a cost of the project. When you extend the project, you have already increased the short cost. When there's may be needed, there is a short cost. So projects that are ongoing, or that may come, will now be affected. They are cost, they will be cost escalation. Although these are subject to negotiation and um, agreement between the parties. But what should we do? What should national economies do? And particularly, what should Nigeria do? Any time that there is an economic downturn in any nation, the easiest way to approach it is to direct expenditure of the little, little amount of money that will be available to them to the high impact sector of their economy so that a turnaround can immediately be achieved within a short time. Our construction happens to be one of the high impact sectors. So if we are to give recommendations for our country and many other countries, we need to have a quick review of the impact sectors of the economy. They are no longer the business as usual. Those sectors that are going to immediately be impacted upon such that they will generate the economy and get people employed, those are the sectors that we must focus on. And for me, I would, I would suggest sectors like construction, agriculture, housing, uh, um, and other such as trade, manufacturing. Those are the sectors that will have high impact. Then, there we need to review agreements. Do we need to continue the construction contract that we have 
are they going to be of that impact, or do we need to have new ones that could be of high impact? And then the experts have to be reviewed based on the fact that there's been an unforeseen circumstance. Then, of course, I would recommend that there will be a massive needs be still at some program. How will that work? Because a lot of them are already at home. They will need an avenue to quickly get back to activity. And how will they get back to activity? It's only when they have to, to be able to serve the population, the people of their various countries. And so we need to assess what are those things that we can easily impact that will have a full advantage of arresting unemployment at the same time as empowering the large proportion of the population. Then there should be the national manufacturing to support construction methods. Well, in a country such as Nigeria, there is this pandemic is an opportunity for us to look towards. What are those things that we, we need to understand how to use our own? God giving natural mm. of uh, materials to produce shelter for ourselves. Then we also Doctor, need... our time is almost up. All right. So uh, I was just going to add that we need uh, government support for this sector by providing single digit loans that can be assessed. And finally, let me also say that I want to recommend that going forward, we want to re re rejuvenate our economy, we should immediately establish what I would call a national post-COVID-19 rehabilitation fund. That fund will be responsible for supporting industries and construction areas that will help the economy to be galvanized and come back. Thank you so much. I have very little time, and so I cannot say more. Thank you very much, um, Doctor, for that very elaborate presentation. Uh, we have already run out of time, but I'll ask my uh, host, Barista Festus, to quickly review a couple of the key questions that our panelists will need to respond to while we continue the conversation uh, online after this timeout. I'll also ask my chairman, uh, the panelists, uh, we've eaten so much into your time, we promised that we would not go beyond four o'clock. So we will just summarize, we'll ask uh, the chairman to summarize the uh, presentations. But if you have something you will need to respond to quickly, you can just uh, uh, indicate so that we can uh, allow you to uh, make the remark as you deem appropriate. Uh, Barista Festos, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, the moderator, Yuda, uh, and Tony Hopwa. Really wonderful time. And we have been receiving so many questions from people. But just as you said, time is fast paced and uh, we will not be able to accommodate all these questions. Uh, permit me to just raise these three questions for the panelists to look into. The first question for Nigeria to diversify its economy. Put in, I don't know. If so, what are some of the components you are considering? I don't know. The person must also be an artisan because I could not even understand the sentence very well. I'm sure the question goes to the first speaker. Then the second one. I think this is this question is from somebody who's very passionate about uh, construction artisans and work of system. And the question is, when is construction artisans award taking place? That should be able to be answered by either the chairman or the DG. Uh, we have many of them on the uh, as panelists, and my moderator will, will look into that. Then the third question is: Can system help artisans get job? That is another question. Then the other question goes to barista. I mean, engineer. The panelists from a Shattered Institute. Construction Industry Training Board. The question is this. Nelson. The question is this. How do you think it's possible for the artisans to all be doing their jobs online for people? 
How practicable is this? And what exactly do you have to say on the way forward? Since the rule of social distance, distancing must be maintained. That is the question, sir. That is the question, uh, the few questions I think we can take, and there are others. Others can be forwarded later. Thank you, sir. To moderator, please. The first question goes to uh, the DG, Abuja Chamber of Commerce and Industry. Uh, diversification of the economy. Did you get that? DG, are you with us? Yes, I'm with you. Yes, I got okay. a question. All right. Okay. Uh, I, like I said, yours spans across multiple sectors. Uh, what can we do? And like I also indicated earlier on, some of the solutions we are proffering may actually create more unemployment. What do we do about that? Yeah. And how do we broaden the space? Apart from sending some people into early retirement. Okay, I'll start with your own question. Um, if you read about the industrial revolutions, the first, second, third, you would see that even um, when those revolutions were happening, people were afraid of losing jobs. Mm. The horsemen were afraid that when the uh, trains, the steam engines start working, that they were not going to have jobs. But today, somehow, the revolutions uh, sort themselves out. People eventually find somewhere to fit themselves into. So I know that your concerns are very valid. Uh, we need to, these are things that, because we're in modern times, we really need to look at them carefully. We need to also innovate. Um, I know that, and it's a matter of concern, that um, artisans, what, how is an artisan going to learn online? We need to innovate. We have gotten to that point where something just has to be done. Either we innovate on the tools or we innovate on our learning methods. Now, if you are, um, the way we do construction in Nigeria is the artisans really connect with each other. So the, this person carries a block and gives it to this person and the person lays it and all. Is there a way now that we can look at um, um, innovating on even the tools such that the artisans don't really need to connect with each other so closely. I'm just uh, thinking uh, aloud. I think we really need to look at this thing because eventually this is going to happen. Um, but the, coming to the first question, you said, what is my organization doing? And I, and I responded, but I would still uh, respond to you uh, verbally. Uh, the chamber is basically uh, an association that protects the interest of its members. So what we do is we do a lot of advocacy with government. We, while of course we also try to see if we can get support for businesses that are non-governmental. So what we do is for foreign direct investment, we advocate for policies, we advocate for infrastructure, for funding of um, several sectors that are not, of course, the oil sector because we're looking at diversification. And we also try to woo foreign direct uh, investments. Um, we also match our, our members to businesses outside this country where they can, you know, do some knowledge sharing um, and, and um, transact with each other. So I hope I answered your question. I'm trying not to speak to um, yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. The next question, I think, is for Barry. And after that, I, I guess we will have to leave all the others to come online. Barry, uh, the idea of virtual reality is uh, still alien to us. But uh, I guess that's part of the way to address some of the challenges that we'll have going forward. But uh, maybe one last word of advice from you. Yeah. Virtual reality, we use virtual reality. Um, and online and YouTube, it's a good way of showing people how things can be done. But I would give you the example of, I recently went on YouTube to learn how to dismantle and repair my, the, the wheel of my bicycle. And I, I learned how to do it and I took it off and I put it all back together again and it still doesn't work particularly well. 
And the lesson there is you might know how to do something, but when it comes to artisan work in certain areas where the hand skills are needed, there is still always going to be the requirement to teach people how to do something practically. But we have moved a lot of our learning that we did in our mobile training unit onto online and it's working really successfully. I think the trick, and we are still learning how to do this, is how to make online learning absorbable by the majority of people who mm. have varying learning styles. Um, but certainly it can be done. We are, we are learning to do it. As I say, the technology isn't new, but I think how we use the technology is, is where the, the development for the, certainly in the teaching side um, is, is going to be there. But also not everyone has access to the technology. Not everyone has access to all uh, Wi-Fi and such like. So I think even within Northern Ireland, uh, we have to think of this, this way of blending um, both the online and practical training. Um, so there are certain skills that will never be learned online, can only be learned, especially if you have an industry and construction is one that relies on quality. A job that is done not well could kill people further down the road in a building collapse. So it's very important that not only people, not only do people know how to do things, but actually how to deliver it practically with their hands. Well, thank you very much. Um, for the other questions, we will try to see how we can respond to the various contacts. And of course, the recording will be available. This may be just the first part of this conversation because we have to, a lot to do. Uh, the challenges are there, the opportunities are there. I'll just call on Chairman now to wrap up uh, and summarize what we, the key points we've received from the various speakers. Uh, these um, panelists, you will have to forgive me. I said we were going to have a quick word uh, to wrap up, but uh, this opportunity will come when we have the second part of this uh, seminar or this webinar. Thank you very much. Uh, Chairman. Oh, thank you so much, uh, Abu Moderator and the Dr. General Assistant. Uh, I'd like to appreciate the panelists for the various contributions. Um, I may not be able to wrap it up, but like you said, it is recorded and we analyze it and draw out from it certain things that we need to be able to manage ourselves towards stimulating the economy and creating employment in the wake of COVID-19. Um, so many ideas have come on board, and there are so many of them that time will not permit us to be able to give here. And I will say encourage all the panelists to please avail us of some of those ideas that uh, we need to move into. One key thing is that that have come out is that the construction sector and the agriculture sector are high impact sectors that will help us to stimulate the economy and employment, and therefore we begin to dimension the process of ensuring that that happens. The second key area also is that um, the skill industry is something that with, with our abundant population, we should be able to develop more. India was able to transform itself to a skill uh, nation, exporting skill to surrounding areas, skill artisan, uh, skilled artisans to various sectors. And that is something that we will need to also see how we we'll do for ourselves. Um, like I also be said that there are certain sectors, certain skills that can never be learned online. We therefore should be able to find a way to manage those skills post COVID-19 so that in the wake of those contacts that is needed for us to learn those skills, we know how to manage the health issues and dimension some of the risks and provide mitigants on uh, uh, making sure that those who are in contact with those who do not get to endanger their lives and their families by way of contracting some disease. Um, I do know that the artisans themselves are hardly able to participate on webinars for so many reasons. So we are representing quite a number of them in what we are doing here, so as to ensure that what we have learned in our various areas of influence, we'll be able to contact with them. I do think that we also, know that there are a lot of policy issues that will have to come on board. We are aware that we have a debt of artisans. We also are aware that 
the artisans form the base foundation for the uh, growth path many people want to have from being single uh, skilled artisans to moving into being entrepreneurs that rather employ uh, some other people or be able to have apprentices under them. And therefore, we are going to also develop the, uh, those, that key area. We do also have, like the question that came in, how do they have jobs? We have the work masters or we have the other tools that were put in place. We are not able to provide them on this particular occasion. But I'm sure that going forward, we would like to also know that the system is preparing to make sure that the security issues that arise from allowing any kind of person, whether it's somebody that is current coronavirus or somebody that is having some diseases to enter into your house to repair your electrical appliances or your plumbing. These are some of the challenges that so many people are asking questions. How do we manage this issue? We, we, they were managing the issue of security, a thief invading the privacy of their home, entering into their innermost part of their home. But now we are now being worried about an artisan sweating it out and releasing coronavirus into the homes of people. So these are many other issues I believe that the next time we come on board, we'll be able to dimension them and bring them in greater detail and be able to assign some key solutions to how we'll meet all and some of these challenges that we see in the sector. On behalf of the board, we want to thank all the panelists and thank those who are participants and to assure them that all the questions, all the contributions they have made will be taken into consideration. And when next we come around, we'll be able to ensure that solutions are provided. And of course, like I mentioned by the Director General, we'll have all these issues online so that we'll be able to, we can go up there and be able to pick out areas that you find very necessary for you to operate with or to make contributions to. Thank you so much, the moderator, for this. Thank you very much, Chairman. Uh, Barista Festus, Chief Executive Officer of Enpesadeb and Convener of the Abuja International Housing Show. Your advocacy in this sector has been very, very much of a challenge for us. We appreciate mm. the partnership with you. I mm. believe that the other participants, you were impacted on them one way or the other. The Abuja Chamber mm. of Commerce and Industry, uh, the National Board for Technical Education, the Federal Ministry of Labor and Employment, uh, our partner from Northern Ireland, uh, and uh, uh, Dr. Palu, our own chairman of the Construction Artisans Awards, and all the other participants. Uh, we want to appreciate you, and uh, you will be receiving further notices from uh, FESADEP on uh, a series of webinars during this season. Thank you very much once again. Barry Safestos, uh, you'll have the last word today. Over to you. Our very important uh, speakers, we thank you one by one for this great uh, uh, presentation. I wish we have better time for you because of the quality of people that I met on this program today. My sister from uh, Abuja Chamber, I feel like I allow you to continue to talk. Ogai DK Mohamed, I appreciate you. I bow for you here. I discovered we have stopped you from making some salient points you came with. Don't worry, we will look for a better opportunity to get you back and give you enough time to make more impact that we want to make for the sector. Uh, the chairman of a uh, system, our own uh, indefatigable Reverend Shime, our leader, Samson of Palua, PhD, builder, we appreciate you, and my partner, leader, builder Okwa. This is the end of the webinar discussion on the subject COVID-19, stimulate simulating the economy and employment in the wake of the global pandemic. We promise that the video and other necessary materials will be available in the next 24 hours. This is the end of the program. Thank you and bye for now. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.
Thank you very much, Tim. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. Have a nice evening. Have a nice evening.